IFS using an airtight... That's right, but whose rocket are they on? Right. The, he stole it from you. The Russians, right, okay? It's the Russian spacecraft that, that we're using now because it's the only way to get into space. This is some of the pictures that are going on with the Russian space agency. This is a Soyuz rocket down here. This is what they use. They've been flying this for many, many years successfully. And this is the spacecraft that they use. It's also called a Soyuz. And it takes up three astronauts, cosmonauts, whatever you want to call them, three people at a time to the space station. And they also return them back safely to the Earth, three at a time. But that's the only means that we have to the International Space Station right now, is using the Russian Soyuz rocket and the Soyuz vehicle. There's another country that's also very active in space now. What country is that? Does anybody know? Yes, China. Very good. China, uh, ever since, ever for about five or six, for, since 2003, have also been launching people into space. Uh, this is their Long March rocket. They also have a small space station in space, and you can see they did a spacewalk, and most recently they just launched two of their astronauts. They call them Taikonauts. Uh, they just launched them, I think, last week, and they're going to be up there for a month in space. So those are the three countries that are active with human spaceflight. United States, Russia, and China for now. Yes, sir? When was the last time we landed on the moon? Oh, the last time we landed on the moon was a long time ago. I know. Does anybody here know? I'll give you a hint. It's 1970. I think it's 72. 1972. Now, for the 10 point bonus question, who was the commander of that Apollo? Oh, first of all, what was the name of the mission? Apollo? 17. Right. 17. He's going to steal all the answers here tonight. Okay. He's doing, oh, he's got the other one. That's okay. He's in the front. That's the privilege of being in the front row. You can just call the answers out, okay? Apollo 17, now hold off and let me get someone else's. Who is the commander of Apollo 17? Armstrong. No, Armstrong was 11. Gene? Cernan. Cernan, very good, Gene Cernan, right. In fact, he just made a special called The Last Man on the Moon. It's on Netflix. Enjoy yourself watching that. You didn't know I was doing a commercial for Netflix. <laughs> so very good though, but right. And, and a fine question, son. That keep those going. That's right. So we have, but we haven't been up in space now for a good five years because of the space shuttle program being over. And by the way, a lot of times people come up to, to me and say, "Oh, how come the program got canceled?" It didn't get canceled. It completed its job. It was flying for 30 years. 30 years on the same vehicles is pretty, pretty good. How, pe how many people keep their cars for 30 years? Of course, they weren't always maintained like this, but still. So uh, the thing is now, we're now staging to another program. Another question? How come they're saying that we're going to land on Mars, but we're not doing it yet? Uh, we'll get to that. That's another good question, though. Let me get to that a little later, OK? So China is also in space. So look at that slide. Very interesting. Thank you. Right? So what is the next plan for the United States and NASA? And that is, let, let, me, let me get to the answers now, okay, before you hit me with another question. So the thing is, is that uh, uh, NASA has so-called a plan to get to Mars. Now, gone are the days of saying, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and here's the date we're going to get there. No more space race. We did that in the 60s because of politics, not because of engineering. So now this is a science mission to get to Mars. This is not easy. Right? The three things about space are it's expensive, it's hard, and it's dangerous. And so you just don't do this on a lark, and you certainly don't do it in a rush. You do it right, and that's what's happening here. So this is NASA's journey for Mars. Now this is NASA, this is a government agency, so you're going to get charts like this. All right? It looks kind of like Earth has almost got tentacles out trying to get to Mars. But this is their master plan for getting to Mars. So that's very easy to understand, right? Right. No, it's not like an IRS tax form. It should be broken out. This is something that we'll see here. They have basically three phases of the way they're going about this. They want to prove that we can have our new spaceship be Earth reliant. And I'll talk about what that ship's going to be. So we want to stay around the Earth in Earth, low Earth orbit and test out the systems. And that's what's happening now with the space station. We're learning how to keep people in space for at least six months, maybe to a year at a time. 
And then we want to move out a little farther. Because the thing about being in Earth orbit, if something bad goes wrong, you can pretty much get back down to the Earth in a few hours. The next thing is what they call the proving ground. They want to go out in the, to, uh, in the area around the moon. Now, there's a new term out, and you're going to hear this a lot, so let me explain it now. It's called cis-lunar space, C-I-S, lunar. Cis-lunar space means anything from our upper atmosphere all the way out to the moon and maybe a little bit beyond, out to the Lagrange point, if you know what that is. So, or maybe even me later. So in this area of cislunar space, they call the proving ground. So missions will then go around the moon, in the area of the moon, maybe out to an asteroid, and, and prove ourselves that way. And this way, it, it's an area that w they can study and they can make sure everything is working okay. Because once again, if something goes wrong, you can get back in days. Not hours, but at least it's not months or a year. Once they're, pr once they're happy with that, then it's moving on to Earth independent, is what they're saying. And that is now we feel pretty good about this, so now we can push out to Mars. Now we can orbit Mars. We can go out that far and do things. ...of their approach. So if someone says to me, when are we going to get to Mars? There's no date. Approximate date is around the 2030s. Seems like a very long time from now, and then it, it definitely is. But the thing is, it's going to take time. Now, how are, we going, how are they going to do it? I keep saying we. It's never we. It's they. They're developing something called the Space Launch Okay. Uh, the, uh, the ship is pretty tall. It's over 300 feet high. It's basically one giant rocket. It has solid rocket boosters on the sides. This is an outgrowth of the space shuttle system. Space shuttle system boosters had four segments. These have five, so they're more powerful. They're strapped on to a main booster here, which has the same hydrogen-oxygen liquid mix. And then up in the top here is a small first stage. And then finally, the business end is way, way up here. The very first model is going to be on a little bit on the smaller side, small. And then once they improve on that, they can make it a little bit bigger, add a bigger second stage, and they can carry up more and more stuff. But right now, they want to start off with a basic model. You'll notice this core stage here is the same on both of them. So that core stage <laughs> stays the same. Then even, they can go even farther, and they can start putting a giant cargo fairing on the top, and they can get really high, and then get up much, 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 much more um, equipment into space. If you want to get an idea of just how big I'm talking about here, this is the initial SLS here, and it's a little bit bigger than the Statue of Liberty. But if we all remember the Saturn V, which took us to the Just to show you a little bit of the inside and what the business end of it is, this is the uh, fuel tanks, hydrogen and oxygen, that gets everything way up. And then into this smaller section here is the part that actually goes into orbit. Um, this is an upper stage here, but this, which looks like tiny, is finally the actual crew compartment. And for the original crew, for the crew compartment that's going to be part of the space launch system, it's something called Orion. For in the moon days, we had Apollo, now we have Orion. And this is going to be the actual vehicle that's going to hold the humans. Uh, initially, it's going to hold four astronauts. Uh, pound for pound, uh, the space, uh, the, the, the shuttle could take up about 22 tons of cargo. The SLS will take 70. So it's a lot more powerful and can do a lot more, which is the way we want it to be. This is sort of a, this is a close-up so you can see what the actual Orion looks like. Looks amazingly like the Apollo, doesn't it? It's kind of interesting. All these years have gone... ...going in space and re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, this is the, being worked on here, and this is what it looks like in space with, of course, its solar panels for power. 
you're probably going to, uh, that's another configuration of it when it's cruising. You're probably going to wonder just how does it compare to Apollo. So I put this up for you where uh, it shows it's, it's bigger than Apollo, uh, but basically the same size. It's, it's holding initially about four astronauts. I think it can go up to seven if need be. Now here's the interesting part of this. Again, I don't know about you, but I grew up with space many space missions. It takes a lot of equipment and money to put it together. So this is the schedule so far. You may remember a couple of years ago in December, there was a test launch and it was done on Titan rockets and the Apollo vehicle was on top, excuse me, the Orion uh, crew capsule was on top and it was sent into space and brought back pretty quickly just to test it out and it tested out pretty good. So that was back in December of 14 and it was fairly successful. But the next mission to go up and it's uncrewed is not going to be until November of 2018. So we're still two years away from the first launch of the SLS. So be patient. But even after that happens, and again, that's uncrewed, it's not going to be uh, until 21, 23, till the first crew goes up in a full um, Orion SLS mission. In between there, until around 2022, they're going to use the, the SLS to send a mission now to Europa. Who knows where Europa is? And I'm not saying Europe, I'm saying Europa. Anybody know where Europa is? Go ahead. Uh, close. Where is it? Moon of Jupiter. Jupiter. It's a moon of Jupiter. And it's proved most fascinating because it's pretty well thought of that it might have an actual liquid ocean underneath the surface. So it's very tantalizing to explore it. So Congress has approved a mission to go explore that. And the only way we got to get there is the SLS. So that's going to be around 2022 before we even launch crew back into space. And then after that, 2026, another crewed launch for this. You may have heard of it every now and then. Uh, there's an idea. Let's go get a piece of an ass. Um, a question. Yeah. Okay. Isn't Europa the um, moon that orbits a bit too close to every once in a while and it like its gravitational pull um, tugs on the planet to like slightly break it apart and geysers happen and everything? Mm, yeah, it, it, you're actually, there's so many moons of Jupiter, you're actually thinking of one of, of Saturn, I think it's called Enceladus. That actually oh. has, right? Oh. Good. Oh good, I made a point with that. Uh, yes, that one actually has geysers, water geysers coming out, but you're absolutely right. It doesn't, not that it comes too close, but you'll find when you study astronomy, there's two words you'll say a lot. When you say, when they ask how many or how much, it's billions. When you ask why, it's almost always gravity. All right? So you've got it right there. The gravity around Saturn does tug at Enceladus in such a way that it shifts it, cracks open the surface a little bit, and the geysers come pouring out, which is absolutely fascinating. Because yeah. it turns out it looks like there's water everywhere. But way back on Jupiter, so that was an excellent question. So way back on Jupiter, there's water, they think, and in Europa too. So all these things are going to uh, uh, hold our interest for quite some time. And what's your first name, young man? Matthew. Matthew, you may very well be one that's on the crew that goes to <laughs> Europa or Enceladus. I'm Don't laugh, it, it may be. You go. Can I get your autograph later? Yeah. Just in case. Okay, Matthew? Yeah. All right. Yes, son? Well, Jupiter is, but not its moons. And that's what we're talking about, right? That's fine. That's okay. Yes, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, they're all giant big gas balls, okay? But their moons are going to be uh, fun to visit. By the way, can you imagine beautiful Saturn with its rings? Can you imagine, though, being on a moon of Saturn, like Enceladus, for a while, and you look up and you see Saturn rising in the morning? That's got to be awesome. So, Matthew, maybe you'll send me a picture when that happens, okay? Yes, son? What makes up the rings of Saturn? Actually, it probably was a collapsed moon many long, long time ago. It had a small moon that got too close, and it pulverized in the debris field of rock and ice is what's left around, around Saturn, and that causes most, actually causes most rings like that. Yeah, it got in its Roche limit. Very good, Roche limit. Very good. I like you, Matthew. Okay, so that's it for SLS. Okay, one second, son. 
So that's it for human spaceflight for the United States and NASA. It's hard, it's expensive, and it's dangerous. And it's going to take all these years just to get us off our planet and to do some exploring. But that's what NASA's job is, is to go out and push the outside edge of the envelope and explore. And these are the things that they've chosen to explore for now. But who knows? We're going to have many presidents and many different congresses between now and those years. And that's what controls the space agency. So we'll see what happens as things perhaps change. Stay tuned. Russia now has their own space program. They've had their space program even before the United States, ever since 1957 with Sputnik. It's, the agency is not NASA, obviously. It's called, it's, its shortened name is Roscosmos. And that's in control of what goes on in the Russian space program. So right now they're busy with their rockets. They have two main rockets. They have the Soyuz, which takes people up and down to the space station. But they also have a proton rocket, which is more powerful. And between these two, they're in business bringing people up and down from the space station. But they're also launching satellites, communication satellites, navigation satellites, anything they can do. It's a business that they have in Russia. And this is pretty much what they've been doing. Now, trying to figure out what they're going to do next and what their future human spaceflight plans are, it's kind of difficult. You can search all you want and you can find different things, but there really isn't any concrete plan right now. Whether they don't want to make it public or it's just difficult or maybe they're not sure themselves, it could be any of those things. Remember, spaceflight is expensive and Russia right now is having a little bit of economic woes too. And so it's tough to fund everything. But if you read the literature, uh, one of the things that's for sure is they are building a new Cosmodrome, which is where they launch things from. It's far out in the eastern part of Russia. It's called, uh, I hope I pronounced this right, Vostochny Cosmodrome. It's not finished yet, but they did launch a to the moon, establishing a colony on the moon, and even perhaps establishing their own space station. Our space station, not ours, but the International Space Station, of which we're a part of, is only designed to, and, and going to be funded, not so much designed, but it's going to be funded only probably for maybe another 10 years, 8 to 10 years, and it's pretty much run its course. But again, who knows, and who knows how it will be used. Question? Wasn't Russia the first, um, wasn't Russia the first people in space? Yes. 1950, uh, yes, in the 1960s. Um, back to the third, so that's pretty much all I can tell you about Russia. I don't know anything else, but watch them because uh, they certainly haven't lost interest. Now the People's Republic of China also has a space agency, the China National Space Administration, and they have a whole series of, ro of launch vehicles. They're called, mainly called launch This was their first uh, uh, person in space, uh, October of 2003. He went up alone. And like I said, they also, their, their spacecraft are called Shenzhou. And uh, he went up and, and proved the muster. And China then entered the uh, Association of Countries, which now put a human in space. Um, since 2003, they've sent six crewed missions with 11 different astronauts, or as they call them, Taikonauts. And they have definite plans for moving forward. They hope to, they have been experimenting with space stations. In fact, right now, the two astronauts that just went up now uh, are, are just docked with their second uh, small space station. It's called Chang'gong, Chang'gong 2. And, uh, And they hope to have a full-service space station permanently staffed by 2022. So China has plans, and watch. They'll be very active. They also have plans for going to the moon. Why do they want to do this? They're, they want to show um, that they're their country's pride. They want to show that they're technically capable. And they want to do the scientific research. By the way, Tiangong-1, the first station they put up there, They've lost control of it. It's ended its usefulness. And fortunately, they're not sure where it's going to land. So you'll hear in the news next year sometime. <laughs> Oops.
you, you're going you're gonna to hear in the news, I'm sure the news media will make a big deal about this. I remember there was a song about Skylab falling on your head years ago. So there'll be news about this, and uh, so we'll be looking up. Uh, it shouldn't but run into anything. It should burn up all in the atmosphere, but it'll cause for a new stir. So remember, I said it first, okay? Um, this is uh, the picture I just came back of the two recent uh, uh, Chinese uh, Taikonauts uh, that went up to space. So that's it for the, the three countries that have active space programs that I know of. Now let's talk about commercial. Because when NASA decided some years ago that they wanted to stick to space exploration and go to Mars and go to an asteroid and maybe Europa, they still needed to service the space station. And right now, like I said, Russia is the only way that we can get up and down to the space station. So they contracted with commercial uh, companies here in the United States to see if they can take up the, that, that segment. Not only send supplies to the space station, but also send crew. So once again, the United States can launch their own astronauts from American soil. So they, they had three uh, companies that were bidding for this position. One was SpaceX, one was Boeing, and one was Sierra Nevada Corporation. And they went through some trials and some tests, and at the end, SpaceX and Boeing were awarded the contracts to build ships and have contracts to bring, excuse me, to bring astronauts into space. Right now, SpaceX is delivering cargo. Um, also, the uh, uh, another company uh, who flies the Antares is also uh, servicing the space station too. They just launched one a few days ago, just docked, I think, on Sunday. Uh, but Boeing is uh, the uh, other company that now that's going to bring people and astronauts back up into space. So they're designing this. Notice how they all look like the original Apollo. Uh, but being Boeing, they don't call it... Uh, anything but an air, a space liner. So they actually call it the CST-100 space liner. It uh, has the capability, or the requirements for NASA is that it has to have the capability of having seven astronauts on it. And so this is what it looks like on a cutout. But Boeing is just building the uh, spacecraft, just the CST-100 up there. This rocket that they're going to use is just a, a rocket from anybody they can buy a rocket from, most likely. the arm for astronauts to go along. So this is getting closer and closer. But that's going to be one of the ways that uh, we're going to get astronauts back in space. The, uh, the CST-100, which is going to, that's what it's going to be called, with some heavy-duty airbags. SpaceX, this is the company now that's headed by Elon Musk, uh, who's personally my hero. Um, he also has developed the Tesla electric car. He is also in business with Solar City, and he's in business to save the planet. So how can he not be your hero? But anyway, uh, this is their crew dragon that they're developing. Same type of thing, except they have their own rockets. And Crew Dragon is, uh, they already have pictures of what the inside of the craft looks like. And there's the seven uh, people pretending to be astronauts in the, in the craft. Um, one thing you'll notice, it's not really jammed and packed with uh, instruments like the Apollo was. Miniaturization of equipment and whatnot has changed things. So it's pretty much just an empty shell with the astronauts, including an all-digital view screen. The one thing that sets apart, though, the Crew Dragon from the Boeing CST-100 is that the Crew Dragon will have propulsive landing. It'll actually come down like a rocket ship of science fiction days. Elon's already experimenting this with landing boosters back at Cape Kennedy as well as on a, uh, on a barge, believe it or not. And he's successfully done that many times. So this is a, a test of one actually landing. And that's how it will be done, so it can land right back at Cape Kennedy or anywhere it wants to. Oops. This is another view from the inside, certainly nice and glitzy. 
um, just seats, walls, and a uh, touch panel display. That's the way to go into space, isn't it? Um, it'll again dock with the space station. The nose cone lift flips up, it connects, and that's how it transfers the three or seven astronauts in this case. Or up, uh, it has seven because there's seven on the space station. But they can fly anywhere from three to seven. Now SpaceX has a lot more plans than just uh, uh, servicing the space station. They plan to build a bigger rocket. They're basically going to take their Falcon 9, put three of them, strap them together, and they're going to call it the Falcon Heavy, and it's going to launch much, much bigger payloads into space. Everything's got to do with power. By the way, each, each Falcon 9, this always freaks me out when I, when I see this, but they know what they're doing. Each Falcon 9 has nine separate engines on each rocket. So here they're going to strap three of them together. So Matt, when you do the math, Three times nine is what? 27. 27 engines are going to fire on this thing. Sounds like a lot of engines, right? Well, that's the, one of the reasons they have so many engines is designed so that if one or two fail on the way up, it doesn't make a difference. It can still achieve orbit and attain its mission. So that's their plan. Um, now, that's just the stuff in near-Earth orbit that they're going to be working on. One of the things that they just announced is that is he definitely, uh, SpaceX and, and Elon Musk definitely have their eyes on Mars. They want people to be on Mars quickly. And so it turns out that the Earth and Mars are sort of in favorable lining, lined up positions every two years to uh, make it close enough for spacecraft to visit Mars. And so we do, uh, NASA does that now with their landing craft. So what they want to do now is they want to modify their Crew Dragon and make it so that it can go all the way to Mars. They're not going to put a crew on it, but they want to start testing out the landing, landing these craft on Mars. So every two years now, starting with 2018, they're going to send a Dragon to Mars and test it out to see if it can land. And they're calling it the Red Dragon. So watch for that. And that's just in a couple of years they're going to start doing that. Now the thing is, is like I said, Elon has big plans for going to Mars. He wants us to be multi-planetary. And so you may or may not have seen it, but just a few weeks ago he announced the big plan for getting humans to Mars. And so these are some animations that he's put together of a huge rocket that he wants to build that will take about a hundred people at a time all the way to Mars. It'll launch and go into space, unfurl its solar arrays, and then get to Mars in uh, hopefully not too long a time. And then uh, there you'll be as you approach Mars and uh, land uh, to start a colony, quite frankly. Uh, this is basically a one-way trip. If you want to come back, you just get back on the rocket because they need the rocket back to repeat the process. It's going to be launch and landing, launch and landing, no throwaways. The analogy they always say is imagine if every time you got an airplane, it was thrown away after it was used. We'd never get anywhere. And so they're making ships that are reusable, and this is a part of the big, big plan. Now, Matt, take a look at this. Do you recognize what, what this is representing? Where, where is it landed on? We were talking about it before. The um, Europa? No, nope, the other one. Oh. Um. And... Enceladus. Enceladus. Yeah, because he's saying if we can go to Mars, we can go anywhere. Anywhere where we can land. And so this is just a, a still picture of, you could take this all the way to Enceladus if you want. You never know. So that's it for SpaceX. Pretty exciting. And by the way, he wants to do this all within the next 10 years. So that's pretty ambitious, but that's the name of the game with him. Now let's get to the fun stuff. Have you heard of Virgin Galactic? Okay, who runs that? Branson, right, from the Virgin Airlines. Well, the thing is, all during this time, he's been building a spaceport out in New Mexico. It's called Spaceport America. And it, what his plan is, is to give everybody who can afford it a ride into suborbital space so that you can have a few minutes of weightlessness and enjoy being officially an astronaut. This is how it's going to be done. This is called Spaceship 2. It's been built and it's been tested. 
and it'll hold six passengers and two pilots. And the way this happens is, is that it actually gets attached under something called White Knight 2, which is a huge airplane. Ever seen anything like that before? Quite, quite interesting. The pilots are actually over here. This is empty, but it's powered by four jet engines, and it can lift the, the uh, spaceship too. So, spaceship two will attach underneath. Those of us who can remember, it's kind of like the X-15 days where it was dropped. The uh, uh, White Knight will go up to 50,000 feet, drop the uh, spaceship two. It'll ignite and go pretty much straight up into the edge of space. Once you get over 62 miles, it's technically space. So it'll be about up at that point. And then that's where you'll be able to float around in the cabin for a good few minutes. And then you come back and you'll land safely back at the airport to get the next crew to go on and go. So they're taking applications. You can go online. I did it before. I didn't sign up. But there it is, ready to become an astronaut. You can just go right to that page, and there it is. Fill in your name, email, and whatnot, and you're on the waiting list. I believe the current, anybody know what the current price is? Quarter of a mil, okay? $250,000. So when you see that in the back of your change drawer, just maybe put down a deposit and, uh, and have yourself a good flight. But this is also gonna be happening within a couple of years, so Watch, watch uh, Virgin Galactic and see how that goes. Another one now that's gotten a lot of attention, lady, is Jeff Bezos and a company called Blue Origin. Jeff Bezos is famous for Amazon, right? We know that, okay? So he's taken uh, his profits from uh, Amazon and he's poured it into his own rocket ship company. Now, Blue Origin is, the, is doing something similar to Virgin Galactic, but instead of using a plane, they're actually using a rocket. By the way, this is a one heck of a logo he's got. Um, it's really quite interesting. If you, if you want to do a little dissertation on symbol, symbolisms and whatnot, take a look at that and explain it to me someday, okay? But that's the Blue, that's the blue Origin the logo. It has a very simple, uh, it's a very simple, straightforward craft. It's a rocket, one stage rocket, and a crew capsule. And that's it. So this is it for real. It's actually taken off and landed four times so far. And this is again, reusable. So it goes straight up. The capsule detaches from the top. It keeps going a little farther. And you, again, you get out of your seats. I think it can hold six people. It has giant windows. You can float around, look at space, look at the curvature of the Earth, get back in your seat, and get ready for a landing. It's landing by parachute. This is all done in Texas right now. And down you come. Meanwhile, the rocket comes softly right back to the launching pad. It has legs that extend out, and it comes right back down and lands, lands safely to be refueled and go back up again. They've done this with the same rocket now four times. So again, Within two years, here's a place to sign up. I don't see a price for the, uh, for the ride yet, but here's another way to get into space. So you've got two companies now that want to get you into space, um, Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin. That's just a picture of the, of the giant crew, of the uh, crew capsule. And of course, once they get successful at doing this several hundred times, they're going to try to put something in orbit, so then you can really go into space. That'll be a lot of fun. I'll mention the Sierra Nevada Corporation because by far they had the coolest looking new spaceship amongst the three. Okay, anybody know the name of it? It's called Dream, uh, Dreamweaver. And uh, it, it, it's definitely, it's a, like a mini shuttle. It looked like a nice little space plane. The thing was, it wasn't selected by NASA to bring crew to the space station, but they did allow it to bring cargo. So you'll be hearing about that in a few years, that it'll be bringing cargo up to the station. Question way in the back. How can that look like the spaceship from maybe the intercellar? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Who had the idea first, right? There's something interesting, okay? With, with ideas comes inspiration. And so the thing is, this, when, you, when you grow up at your age and you've got the ideas, the thing is, when you go to college and you have that engineering or science job, what do you think you're going to be calling upon? 
your imagination from when you were young. And there it is, played out on TV. You know, John mentioned before how I enjoy Star Trek. I certainly do. But those of us who remember Star Trek from the 60s, flip communicators, little diskettes, Mr. Spock hooking the console, Uhura with their earbud. What do we see now? Who do you think designed those things? But the people, the engineers now that were youth then watching the television show, we see, right? So there you go. And that's what happens. So use your imagination now because who knows what will happen. Uh, let's see. Um, <clears throat> Dreamweaver will launch just like uh, the CST-100. They'll simply attach it to another rocket and that will go up, but it will land just kind of like the space shuttle that, uh, did when it was flying. Um, the only thing else I could find about uh, humans in space is that I did find something about India. Uh, they have no concrete approved plan yet, but you do find articles and literature about putting up uh, people in space as well as establishing a space station. So watch India as well. They may be the fourth country as well. Well, would you go over here to the mouse and kill that window, please? Sorry. Anybody ever hear of this? Mars One? You have, right? Okay, this is a this is a company, uh, a private company. We'll, we'll ignore it for now. I'm almost done. This is a private company out of uh, a Norwegian company, and they are definitely uh, planning. Uh, they have plans put together to send people to Mars as well. Mars is a hot spot, and so they uh, they theorize that by 2027. They're going to have a series of capsules on Mars with people in them. Uh, you can sign up for this as well. Uh, their funding is being done very interestingly. And you can read all about it. But right now I don't have anything else to tell you about it because it's, it's their own thing. But it's called Mars One. Well, isn't the Mars One they're going to be doing uh, it's more like a reality show? Or yes. Televised That's exactly right. Trip? That's exactly right. Boy, nothing's working now. Um, yes, what the gentleman is saying is that somebody had the idea that when they broadcast the Olympics, they get lots of the Olympics gets lots of revenue from people watching the Olympics. So they said, "This is how we'll fund our space program. We'll have a reality TV for the Mars One journey and the preparations, and we'll get the revenue from that to fund our program. And let's see if it works." Here's something else I just want to mention to you in closing. Uh, this is Bigelow Aerospace. Uh, this is a man who's developing uh, a company to have uh, uh, habitable modules that are expandable. And by doing this, you can take them into space and you can live in them. And it's an easy way to get large uh, areas of compartments in space. In fact, there's a test one on the International Space Station right now. So basically, they're blow-up modules. I mean, we've seen these things with uh, tennis courts and, and other areas and whatnot. And so uh, it's possible to make them very large and have nice areas of habitat um, very, very cheaply. So lots of ideas, lots of things going on in space. This is the one that's attached uh, to the space station right now. It's a small one, but they're, they've attached it and they're testing it out. So that pretty much concludes everything I have for you tonight about the future of human space flight. So in summary, what am I saying? The thing is we've got the three countries to watch, the United States, but it's a very slow, long program. Uh, we've got Russia, which is uh, in the business of putting up and down uh, rockets all the time. But we've got China, which is actively building their own space station and making plans to go to the moon. So lots of things going on with those countries. But the real action, quite frankly, I think in the next two years, as far as human space travel is, is to watch Boeing and SpaceX as they start shuttling people back and forth to the space station and then really keep an eye on SpaceX with their, pl with their plans for Mars. Now, of course, there's other things going on in space exploration as well. NASA JPL has got all kinds of probes on Mars, out by Saturn, and perhaps to, Encel uh, to, uh, um, to Europa. Thank you. Um, so lots of other cool things are going on, and that's kind of one of the reasons I like this, this field, is because there's always something new going on. Question in the back.
Um, has anyone put a human on an asteroid? Not yet. But that's what the asteroid mission is sort of like. Not really put them on it, but they want to go up and dock with it. And I believe the plan is to actually crawl out and take a piece of it and then bring it back and things like that. That's, a, that's about it for now. Yeah. Son? Wait, isn't it possible to call it, like, um, to make plants on Mars, like in the movie Martian? I love the movie Martian. Did anybody? Did everybody like that movie? It was yeah. well done. Good old Matt Damon. If anybody can go to Mars, he can, right? Uh, it was a great movie. It was very, very factual. In fact, the directors went to the Jet Propulsion Library and spoke with a real scientist to get it as accurate as they could. There's only one thing, unfortunately, that's totally not accurate about the movie, but you've got to give them some, uh, some editorial license. Who knows what that is? What's one fo foundation part of it that's just not true and it wouldn't happen? Go ahead. The storm. Yeah, the storm. The wind storm in the beginning? Can't get wind on Mars. <laughs> Mars's atmosphere is so thin, it could hardly blow over a blade of grass, let alone a rocket ship. But we'll give them that, okay? Just like Sandra Bullock in Gravity, okay? You know, all that stuff was pretty good in that movie, but, you know... When you take off your spacesuit, that's not what you have on underneath. But we'll, 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 we'll give them that. Okay. So, um, any other questions on uh, what I've presented? I've just got a couple of uh, slides of commercials I want to hit you before I let you go, if I may. Number one commercial about me. This is my website, Astronomy NJ. Okay, that's it. It's real easy to remember. This is how you can find me if you want me to come present at any social function or school or whatever. It tells the pro programs that I do and how to contact me. The other thing, the second commercial, is about our observatory here. This is a top-down view. Is there any observing going on outside, John? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact. Well, wait, wait, just a second. Before you tell them where to go, okay. John's good at doing that. Let me tell you where it is that you go. Okay, we're in here. This is the top-down view. The parking lot is here. Way back here, if John talks about it, this is Luna 2. It's down here past the parking lot. And then out here on the south lawn might be telescopes if he says we have that. So I just want to tell you where you go. This is the main entrance where you came in. You can either go out there and go around to the south lawn, go back out to the parking lot down to Luna 2 here, or there's even a way under the dome to get out. Just watch anybody with, with yellow tags that uh, they can also direct you, okay? The is, is open too? To the Great. It is, okay. This is the Shara Observatory. Thanks, John. This is also out near the south lawn. This is also open here. Now let me just mention, depending on how uh, mobile you are, uh, the Luna 2 is on the ground. So you don't need to climb anything or anything. You just need to look through the telescope based on what the, uh, the qualified observer tells you. Out on the south lawn, same thing. If there's a telescope there, you just walk up to the person and ask them to look. But in the, in the Shara Observatory, you do have to go up a few steps on a ladder and crane your neck a little bit because it's higher. I just want to let you know about that. And also, if you do walk upstairs to the dome, there are uh, it's a flight of stairs to get up there. Okay? Any questions on the logistics? I uh, just want to mention, but I, I invite you to stay and, and, and talk with Paul. But as I said, we have the sky is clear, but it looks like it's going to stay clear. We have the, uh, the domes that he mentioned. And I just want to say that we, we just celebrated our 50th years of, of an existence here. And we've done it all on membership and donation. And so if you like what you saw, uh, we do have a donation box back here. And uh, we invite you to uh, express your... Would, uh, I just put up here in words what, uh, what John was saying. I'd like to also echo that too. If you enjoyed tonight, and if you enjoyed any of our other presentations, we are solely funded by our member membership dues. That's it. We don't get any funding from anything else. So if you like what you saw tonight and you want to keep us, support us, I urge you to buy a membership. A membership is only $40 and there are family discounts. If you can't buy a membership, we have a donation box in, in the back. Please, if you could, drop something at least into the donation box. And the last commercial I have for you uh, is something about gift giving. Uh, if you know anything about postal stamps, anybody who collects stamps, there's also something really cool called a first day cover. Well, it turns out that uh, the U.S. Postal Service issued two stamps this year for the exploration of Pluto. Uh, one was the planet and one was the New Horizons spacecraft. 
And so what we did is uh, our observatory created their own cache and created their own first day cover. They were certified and canceled by the United States Postal Service. We only had a limited run on this and they're only $5 a piece. So you get two Pluto stamps, our cache, our first day cover. It's a great gift for the holidays to pass down to children, especially those that are going to be for future pilots. Okay, so if you want those, see me. I'm the one with the, with the black bag. That's it. Any final questions? Yes. All right, tell you what. Come up and talk to me about that question. Enjoy yourselves tonight. See the observatories. See anybody who uh, has the tag, and they'll be able to uh, help you out. Thank you.